Well, good morning. Uh, th for the benefit of those on the internet, we are in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, as we're looking at persecuted church, uh, the church of Smyrna. So, so Smyrna, again, modern-day Turkey, Izmir, Turkey, uh, very loyal to the, the Roman government, uh, the emperor. They persecuted the church. Uh, they persecuted Christians. And if you can imagine what it must have been like to live in a time like that, in, a, in an environment like that where, by and large, everybody around you were were loyal to the emperor of Rome so much that anybody who talked against Rome or the emperor or even introduced any ideology or thought that went against Rome or the emperor, they were persecuted. In fact, uh, Polycarp uh, pastored the church in Smyrna. John was there. John and Polycarp was, was, were buddies. Uh, they were partners. Uh, they they were friends, and and after John planted the church, Polycarp took over and pastored the church. Well, when Polycarp was about eighty six years of age, uh, the Jews, uh, the people there in Smyrna, burned him alive, simply because he was a Christian. He held Christian views that often contradicted the views of Rome or the views of the emperor. That's how bad the persecution was. And so I want to take a break here uh, uh, from the background, and I want us just to kind of talk a little bit. Can anybody think of a time in your, in your life, whether it's recent or whether it's from childhood or uh, maybe early in the workforce, where you felt like you were persecuted or judged or uh, made to feel inferior simply because of your Christian faith. Anybody have a, a, a thought, a story, a, a time where maybe you you felt maybe your faith was was under fire? Anybody? Small story, but I was working at IBM when I became a Christian for the first time. Okay. And. Um, People I didn't know were Christian, just sort of came out of the walls after I after I invited Jesus in. I walked down to the coffee machine and someone was there talking about the Bible study they were having on the lunch hour. Yeah. So I asked if I could join. Well, we wanted to use one of the corner conference rooms for our Bible study, and the company said, no, you can't do that. But there was another group that was playing poker in the other conference room. <laughs> <laughs> so. We got them to change their minds and say, well, if some people want to have a meeting and, and talk about a good book that they've read recently, they can do that. <laughs> you just can't use any IBM resources to, uh, you know, to report it or anything. You can't put it on the bulletin board. You can't send out messages. It has to be personal invitation only. Yeah, wow, yeah. You had to, you know, <laughs> they could play poker in that room, but we couldn't, we couldn't do a Bible study in the other room. Yeah, I've had something similar uh, at Fort Benning uh, where I wanted to, we had some folks in my department uh, that were Christians. We wanted to use the conference room, and our manager said, nope, not for any religious services. You can't, relig you can't mix religion and state, uh, okay. and because we're a government entity, we can't have any religious services, which I thought was a bunch of garbage because yeah. we have chaplains in the Army, yeah. and, and, and we, have, we have churches and, and service. Yeah, so... So uh, the headquarters uh, folks uh, says, well, we have a conference room you can use over here. And so we did it anyway. And for probably about two years, uh, we did much like what we're doing here, verse by verse study through the Bible. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, soldiers and uh, DOD contractors that all took part. Uh, but I just thought it was funny because probably the personal views of the manager uh, conflicted with Christianity, and he didn't want to make things easy for us. And and even with even with having the Bible study at lunch hour, it was every Thursday at lunch we would have uh, Bible study. Well, any other day of the week, if people came back thirty seconds late, two minutes late, or whatever, they just kind of made it up, and it was it was no issue. Well, once we started having our Bible study, the manager would stand at the door 
watching his walk only on Thursdays. And if anybody came in even 30 seconds late, he docked him a half a day's pay. And, and he, of course, he did it in the, in the name of, well, we just got to be wise stewards and we, this is what we committed to. And, and so a lot of his argument was, was a logical argument, but are you going to hold that standard to everybody every day of the week? Or is it just on Thursdays when we're having our Bible study? And, and we had a couple of people that, that was like, you know what, I don't want to be part of the Bible study because I don't want to come under fire. You know, it just kind of showed some true colors. And it's the idea, do we live in faith or do we live in fear, right? And so today we're going to be talking a lot about the Christian church uh, uh, and the persecution that it comes under. Um, I think it's interesting because... Uh, we live in a land that's blessed, that has been blessed by God for many years. And, and now we're starting to see a shift, a change in our culture, right? Uh, and so what I'd like us to do is to go through, and I'm going to read, uh, I want us to read through the scriptures. Then I'm going to talk about how persecution has been prevalent throughout the ages. Uh, and and how by and large for the most part it's been outside the u.s but then i want to provide some examples of how it's now affecting the u.s Absolutely. and and then i want to wrap things up today with what can we do about it what should we do about it okay so that's kind of where we're at and where we're going with with things all right so let's look at revelation chapter 2 and we're going to pick up in verse 8 and again, this is the persecuted church. Verse 8, it says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Let's stop right there for a second. Let's look at that first verse. Uh, really doesn't talk about persecution in the first verse, but I just want for clarification to let's talk about what's being said here. Um, we all know from last week's study, angels here, the angel of the church of Smyrna is who? Probably the pastor. We, if you remember our study on, the, uh, on angels last week, angels can be heavenly beings or they can be human beings. Angels, by definition, simply means messenger. Messenger. And so the messenger can be, like I said, a heavenly being or a human being. The only way we can tell which it is is by the context in which we're reading. So in this case, we're talking about uh, letters being written to the church, to church leadership. And so in this case, it's probably the pastor, an elder, or bishop, an overseer. These, these, all of these terms are synonymous with each other. So when you look at uh, the book of Timothy, uh, the book of Titus, as it's talking about uh, the qualifications of the bishop. Again, bishop, overseer, elder, pastor, all these terms are synonymous. And, and so now we're learning from our study in the book of Revelation that the term angel is also synonymous with those, those other terms. They're messenger. It's a messenger from God to impart God's word to mankind. And so in this particular case, it's the, uh, the letters being written to the pastor or the overseer, the bishop, the angel of the church of Smyrna. And it says, write these things, says the first and the last. What do we make of that, that, that phraseology there? What do you think? Who's, who's, who's talking? It's Jesus. it's Jesus, right? Jesus is using an Old Testament uh, title for God, the Alpha and the Omega, right? And he's referring to himself. And so, he, you know, there's a lot of people, especially within the Mormon faith, that will talk that, well, Jesus never professes to be God. He, he's a God, but he's not the God, right? But here we have an example where Jesus is professing to be God, right? He's referring to himself as the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, right? And so it's a letter written by John where he's kind of uh, 
being like, uh, 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 Miss Mary, we got a chair right here. You can be part of the table. I don't like to stand by this. Sit by this. You don't want to sit. I promise I took a shower. <laughs> so, okay. Here, I'll let her sit here. Tell you, tell you what, uh, uh, Dale, Dale's going to move over here so you can be part of our group. We love you. We just like, I just like to see your, your face. And I know you like to, to see my face so you can hear better. Okay. Now we got that stuff. This, for those that don't know, this is Grandma Mary. Right? I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> okay. I love you. Welcome. So we know that John's writing the letter, uh, taking uh, he's kind of being a dick, uh, taking uh, 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 inspiration from the Holy Spirit, writing the words that Jesus is speaking. Right, uh, he's writing the words that Jesus is speaking, and he says, uh, uh, "Write these things," says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life, talking about Jesus being crucified and resurrected. And Jesus says to the persecuted church, "I know your works." tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. What do you make of that statement? What's Jesus saying here? Well, it, they, they, have, they have faith. They have, they have Jesus, though. It doesn't matter what, type, what situation they're in. They still have the best of the best. So, so it doesn't matter the economic situation or the political situation or otherwise, right? The social situation, it doesn't matter. Any of that doesn't matter. He says, he says, I know your tribulation. I know about the persecution. I know, a, I know that you're poor, but you're rich. I know you're poor, but you're rich. You're rich because you're in a right relationship with me, Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, he says, look, you're abiding in me, and I'm abiding in you, and we've got a great relationship. And so listen, you are rich beyond measure. Being rich has nothing to do with our financial status. I'll say that again. Being rich has nothing to do with our financial status. I think it was uh, Poor Dad, Rich Dad. Who's ever heard of this guy? The Poor Dad, Rich Dad. He wrote a book, right? He talks about being rich is, is getting to the point in life where you can sustain yourself, economically speaking, without ever having to work again. You get to that point, you're rich. I don't think poor dad, rich dad, understood Revelation 2, verse 9. Even if you're poor, you're rich. Rich in the relationship we have with God. Rich in being part of the family of God. Amen? That's what it truly means to be rich, is to, to be in a right relationship with God, right? He goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say through, through the, the writing of uh, John, he says, I know your works, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So in other words, there's people professing to be Jews, but you know, and the Jews are supposed to be God's chosen people, but in reality, they're not acting like God's chosen people. They're acting like heathens because they, they pledged their allegiance to Rome and to the emperor of Rome. And so if you're not for God, you're what? Against, Against him. There's either we, we learn from our study in the book of uh, first and second John, you're, they're, they're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. There's no in between. There's no middle ground, right? And he goes on to say that they are now part of the, the basically the church of Satan. Verse ten: Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. So he's telling them, persecution's coming, suffering's coming, but don't fear. Maintain your faith in me. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and that you will have tribulation ten days. 
In other words, it's not going to be long-lasting. It's temporary. Don't lose the faith. Don't lose hope. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. This crown is not like a royal crown. Think about the Olympic Games. When people compete and they win, they get this wreath that they place upon them as victor, right? God is saying that you guys are going to be competing in a race for your life. Good against evil. Your faith in Christ earns you that crown of life. You will be crowned victorious because remember, the moment Lucifer tried to usurp God's authority, immediately he lost the war. But between now and final judgment, there's a lot of little battles that, that take place. And, and Satan, who we know to be Lucifer, Satan and his demons are engaged in all these battles, right? The Bible talks about we, we are in spiritual warfare, right? All these little battles to try and drag as many people down with him as he can. Misery loves company, company right? Satan wants as many people with him as possible to suffer what he's going to suffer. He's lost. The simple fact that we are Christians, we've already, we are already classified, deemed, judged as victors, as winners. We have earned, not by our own merit, but by Christ's bloodshed on the cross, we've earned the right to be called Christians, we've earned the right to be called children of God, and we are considered victors in Christ. Amen? That's exciting. That's exciting. He goes on, verse 11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So there's a physical death. The first death is a physical death. The second death is a spiritual death. Mm -hmm. Spiritual death. When the Bible talks about spiritual death, it's a total separation from God. Those who do not get saved, those who do not uh, surrender themselves to a holy and righteous God and repent of their sins, they will be affected by the second death. They will be totally separated from, from God. So instead of going to heaven, they will go to hell. Many times... People who die, friends and family, hoping to console the family members. Oh, they're in a better place. Well, that's not always the case, right? If they're, not a, if they're not a believer in Christ, the Bible says clearly, only those who believe Jesus Christ to be Lord, who believe that God the Father raised him from the dead, those people will be saved. Doesn't say anything else about other people, does it? And so the harsh reality is those who don't have a right relationship with God will go where? Yeah. To hell, right? They'll be thrown into the lake of fire just like Satan and his demons. Only those who have a right relationship with Jesus, only those who are obedient to, to his word, and the leading of the Spirit in their lives that truly are sold out the whole route for Jesus Christ without any doubt, only those people go to heaven, right? That will be crowned with the, cr the crown of life, right? Will be allowed to eat from the tree of life, to be like God in that we will live for eternity with Him in paradise. Amen? Amen. And because of that, Satan is just in furious he just he's he's upset he's angry and he wants to attack you and me and drag as many people as he can to the same fate that that is destined for him and that's why the church is persecuted that's why the church of smyrna is persecuted but what about the church apart from smyrna i got a couple of books here uh this one is uh fox's book of martyrs People who have died for their faith, right? And I'm just going to kind of go through the table of contents briefly. 
uh, to gi give you an idea. Chapter 1. Uh, the history of Christian martyrs in, in the first general persecution. Talking about the early church. And then we go into ten primitive persecutions. Talking about the burning at the stake. Uh, you know, being crucified on the cross. Things like this. Uh, um, we got persecution of Christians in Persia. Uh, the papal persecutions. An account of the inquisitions. Persecutions in Italy under the papacy. Uh, the account of, of the life and persecution of John w White, uh, Wycliffe. Uh, persecution of Bohemia under the papacy. Persecution uh, of Martin Luther. Persecutions in Germany. Persecutions in the Netherlands. Um, the story and true, uh, of the true servant and martyr of William Tyndale. John Calvin. Persecutions in Great Britain. Ireland prior to the reign of Queen uh, uh, Mary I. We got persecutions in Scotland during the reign of King Henry VIII. Persecutions in England in the reign of Queen Mary. We got the, uh, the rise and progress of the Protestant religion in Ireland and an account of the barbarous massacre of 1641 simply because they believed in Jesus. The rise in, in, in progress, the persecutions and sufferings of the Quakers. The persecution of John Bunyan, John Wesley. We got persecution of the French Protestants in south of France during the year 1814 and 1820. And then we got the beginnings of American foreign missions and, and how they have been persecuted. We got another book here. It's called Tortured for Christ. It says, solitary confinement, physical and mental torture, extreme hunger, and cold. These were the experiences of Pastor Richard uh, Wormbrand during the 14 years in prison in communist Romania. Richard Wormbrand's crime, like that of thousands of others, was his fervent belief in Jesus Christ and public witness concerning the faith. That was the only reason he was thrown into prison for 14 years. And physically, emotionally persecuted while there. Okay, that's a couple of books. I, I, I did some research. Based on a current uh, poll or research. Currently, this is as of 2022. 360 million Christians are persecuted throughout the world. Daily. That's one in seven globally. Over 6,000 people documented have been persecuted, killed, simply because they profess Christianity. That was in 2022. 5,110 churches have been attacked or closed because of Christ, uh, persecution for their faith. Over 6,200 Christians have been arrested simply for claiming the name of Jesus Christ. 84 million people have been displaced from their homes because of their faith in Christ. 26 million have fleed their, their country out of fear of being killed for their faith. Most of that has been in Asia or Africa. What about the U.S.? What about the U.S.? Many of you would recall a couple high-profile cases in the recent years. We got that of the Little Sisters of the Poor, a group of nuns that, that the Obama administration was trying to force Obamacare on, right? And part of Obamacare was you have to provide contraceptives to your employees, people who want to get abortion, you got to provide these these services and they refused. And so the Obama administration persecuted these people and drug them through the court system for years until eventually the Supreme Court ruled ruled in their favor. Or what about Jack Phillips, the baker? Remember the baker where people were coming in wanting them to make cakes that 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 really went against his his convictions as a Christian, and he refused, 
And so they persecuted him in the courts and they, they sued him. Or Mrs. Stutzman, a florist, where people were trying to get, uh, that would go to the, uh, this person and, and have them make bouquets and flowers and arrangements to support uh, their, their very liberal anti-God agendas. Or what about Coach Kennedy, who was persecuted and fired from his job simply for praying in public? Or how about all of the crisis pregnancy centers across the U.S. that were uh, violently attacked after Roe v. Wade was overturned? Or how about uh, the, the countless churches across America being persecuted by their local governments because they opposed COVID policies? They, 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 they went against local government when they were trying to force them to shut down and they remained open and they remained to, to, to conduct religious services to be a support to the Christian community in a time such as these. To this day, we still have churches in California and in New York and in Chicago and a lot of these uh, democratic-controlled states where they're persecuting the church and they're trying to find these churches Millions of dollars because they refused to close their doors during COVID. <clears throat> or how about this? Our children being attacked in our schools over gender issues, being indoctrinated into thinking that, that they're not who God designed them to be, who God created them to be. Or the fact that they should perhaps feel bad if they happen to be a white child. As if, you know, you are somehow inferior just simply because your skin is white. Or how about our parents who are being attacked because they're going to these school board meetings and they're trying to fight for the rights of their kids to have a good education and not being indoctrinated. We see this time and time again, and, and what is this if it's not persecution of the church, if it's not persecution on, on you and me and our families, simply because we profess to be Christian, because we profess to have a faith in an almighty God, a holy and righteous God. One thing that we've all learned about sin is that it is progressive. It only gets worse. The other thing we learn from Scripture is this place that we're in is not our home. We are strangers here, passing through, right? We are the minority. We are. We're the minority. And as the minority, we'll continue to get persecuted. We'll continue to be shamed in, into having the... the Christian principles that we hold so dear. I think it's interesting, at the beginning of our study today, I asked you guys, who can recall a time of persecution, judgment? And for many of us in this room, we're much older. This was not the case in our day. In fact, in our day, it was popular to be Christian. Politicians, whether they were or were not, they would say, God bless America. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And many of them still do, but some of them cringe at, at the thought of that. Refuse to swear in on the Bible. They want to swear in on the Quran or Book of Mormon or some other uh, Bible that's non-Christian. Right? More and more is sin issues being thrown into our faces. And we should expect this because the Bible tells us it's going to happen. This is what we considered end time uh, events. Things will not get better. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but things will not get better. When we listen to the politicians like DeSantis and Trump, 
Got to make America great again, right? I, I hope they can. And if they do, it's only going to delay the inevitable. Because here's the reality, folks. You know this just as well as I do. Can anybody turn to their Bible and find the United States anywhere in the Scriptures? How about any of the Americas, South America, North America? To include Canada, you know, parts of Mexico. We don't see them in Scriptures. Why is that? I'm asking, why is that? They weren't in existence. They weren't in existence then, but listen, God, He knows the beginning from the end. He mentions countries like Egypt, countries like Turkey, Italy, right? Syria. We see all those countries mentioned in the scriptures. But the Americas are not. Why do you think that is? I'm just trying to use common sense here, logic. Why do you think that is? Maybe because we're not that important. Maybe we're not that important. Very good. I, su I suggest three possibilities. A, just as Marjorie said, we're not that important. We're so insignificant, we're not even worth mentioning. We see that in the genealogies. The genealogies in the book of Genesis, they're not all-inclusive, are they? They only highlight key players. So if the if the Americas are not mentioned, it would it would make sense that we're at that time in the end times in the last day events we are not a key player. The other option, option B, we were absorbed by another entity, and so we only exist by proxy of whoever's controlling us. Rome, Russia. I don't know. China. China. All right. And of course, option C, we've been completely annihilated and we don't exist. Right? Those are really only three options. I don't see any other option. Does anybody else? Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, we are all smart people. We all have a brain. We all have the ability to think and, and to reason and, and to exercise logic. The fact that we're not mentioned in this book, those are only three possibilities. Been annihilated, we don't exist. And, and it's quite possible that that happens, all this talk about nuclear war, right? Or we've been consumed by another entity like China or Russia. Or that we're so insignificant, we're not even worth mentioning. I think it's interesting in, in the book of Genesis and in the book of Jeremiah, it says any friend of Israel is a friend of God. Mm -hmm. Up until recently, the United States have been a friend of Israel. This administration, I'm not so confident. And, and I hope I'm wrong, but if... If things don't go well in 2024, I think we'll continue down a path that beyond a point of no return. That's just my, it's, it's not Bible, I'll be clear. It's just an intuition, a gut feeling, and I hope I'm wrong. But this is what I see. We are definitely living in end time events. Are we not? If you agree, say amen. amen. If you agree, say amen with conviction. Amen. Right? <laughs> and so, what, what, so what do we do about it? What about the Billy Grahams that have started here in America to evangelize the world? Yeah. And we've brought a lot of people to Yeah, the and, and praise God for folks like Billy Graham and Greg Laurie and, yeah. and so many others that have had these large crusades. You know, the United States used to be a chief exporter of missionaries. Right. Now we're the chief importer. Mm -hmm. 
of missionaries because we have lost our way, right? I want to talk briefly. We're almost out of time. I want to talk briefly about so what? What do we do in the light of persecution, in the light of the direction the country is going, not just the country, but the world as a, as a whole, the global economy, if you will, the global church, the global government. I mean, that's what End Times talks about is a one world government, one world finance. You know, persecution is going to happen and it continue to get worse as things go on. So what do we do as a church? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, in full disclosure, I didn't come up with this list, but I came across it and I thought, wow, that's pretty good. Let me share it with y'all, All right? So this person, and I'm not even sure who wrote this. I'd like to give credit where credit's due, but I don't know who wrote this. And so it is what it is. Uh, this person uh, argues nine brief ways Christians can resist the present persecution in America. Number one, love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Matthew 5, 44, right? Number two, love our neighbor as ourselves. We talked about this extensively, have we not? The word neighbor in the Greek is plasion. By definition, plasion means anyone you happen to come across. That's your neighbor. That's who you're commanded by God to love, right? It doesn't say love your neighbor if they're a Christian. Love your neighbor if they're good to you, right? It says, plain and simple, love anyone you happen to come across. Good, bad, or indifferent. Love them. Love them. Be a model of Christian love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And hopefully by doing that, you will win them over to Christ. Amen? Yes. Dick. Uh, raised Catholic, no Bible, anything. But my father always said, do unto others. The golden rule. And have them do unto you. That's Matthew 7, 12. The only verse that I know my number. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's the way I was raised. Absolutely. Uh, the third point he makes, uh, this author makes, is to be shrewd. He quotes Matthew 10, 16. This character trait for Christian is often overlooked. There is no command in Scripture to be winsome, uh, but there is a command to be wise. That means that we must use discernment, read the times that we live in, respond accordingly. Don't be fooled by voices who say everything's okay. Know when it's not okay and when it's time to speak up. The Bible says we need to be wise to the trickery of the devil. Right? So we're commanded to be shrewd. Number four, we need to be praying for our leaders to do the right thing before God. My granddaddy used to always tell me, son, never hesitate to do the right thing. Never hesitate to do the right thing. And so we need to be praying for our leaders that they would not hesitate to do the right thing. That includes our local leaders, our state leaders, and our federal leaders. Right? We just, whether we wanted him or not, we just got a new mayor, Mayor Yemi, right? He, he professes to be a believer in Christ. Well, we need to be praying that the Holy Spirit convicts him of the truth of God's word and that he would rule accordingly, right? Yes. We need to do that for our governor. Governor, uh, what's his finky up there? Polis. <laughs> <laughs> but, but see, that, that's the problem. Yes. Because you come across... You, we know for a fact what this this government right now is, and we know that where they're going. Yep, and we're getting to that in the the points that are being made. <laughs> we're getting to that. Yeah, I feel you, Linda. You know, we got some some corrupt individuals in office mm -hmm. at all levels of government. Yeah, and and we should pray for them anyway. And 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 there's a. There, I'll get to that here in a second, though, what we can do about it as Christians. But we need to be praying for our leaders, that they do right before God. Number five, we need to use the courts. Use the courts to fight for our rights. There's a lot of so solid Christian uh, action groups that have tons of attorneys on staff to help to defend our rights as Christians. Right now in California, there's, there's a couple of churches that have been persecuted by the state of California. 
and these attorneys, Christian attorneys, uh, uh, are fighting for their freedoms and fighting for their rights. And we need to support those type of organizations that do that. Excuse me. And, and this person quotes Acts 25, uh, 10 through 11. I don't know that off the top of my head, so I'm going to read it to you guys real quick. Acts chapter 10. It says, verses 20, uh, 10 and 11, Act, or excuse me, Acts chapter 25, I'm sorry. Acts 25. Verses 10 and 11. This is where Paul appeals to Caesar. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For I am a, a, an offender, or I have committed anything deserving of death. I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. And so in other words, uh, you know, it's the idea that uh, uh, we're using the courts to fight for our rights to demonstrate, listen, we've done nothing wrong. We, we are standing true to the Constitution, which is based off of biblical principles, right? This is what he argues. Number six, recover within your, your churches the understanding that Christ is the head of the church and not Caesar. You know, I just did a wedding yesterday, um, and part of the the talking of, of the wedding vows and the the you know I, I I make a case. I says, listen, weddings is an uh, or marriages are an institution created by God, ordained by God, not by the state, not by the federal government. It was an institution designed and ordained by God, and thus. We should not enter into marriage relationships lightly, but understanding that it's 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 this is before God that we're doing this. And so I make the case that it's not necessarily the government that controls things as much as they like to think they do. It's 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 God. It's, it's a government for the people by the people that was based off of godly biblical principles. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes on to say uh, number seven Christians. And Christian organizations should work to uh, inoculate themselves and future generations with robust resistance to cultural norms. We are at a time now where uh, Satan and his demons have indoctrinated a entire generation of people to embrace anything anti-biblical, anything anti-Christian. And we see the 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 alphabet of people, LGBTQ, XYZ, I don't know, uh, with transgender, uh, homosexual, uh, all these different, ten, you know, gender fluid, you know, what is this nonsense, right? But they're embracing these sinful ideologies and force feeding it into our, you know, down our throats. Uh, you look at Target, putting displays front and center, for the gay pride and they're talking about having bathing suits for, for men where they can, they got tuck friendly bathing suits where they can hide their, 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 who they are as a man. You know, this is, this is an abomination unto God and places like target are putting this stuff front and center as you walk in. So our kids, if our kids are with us, they're being confronted with this evil and we should we should we should speak against that. We should boycott organizations like that. You know, we see this with with uh, the beer company uh, Budweiser and using transgender people to try and sell their alcohol. Now, I don't drink alcohol, but for those that do, we should probably boycott Budweiser or any other company like Target that are doing stuff like that. They're trying to force their agenda on us, our anti-biblical, anti-Christian agenda on, on the rest of the world. Number eight, never ever live by lies. To paraphrase the, the Christian 
dissident Alexander uh, Schloss, I, I can't even pronounce his last name. Anyways, uh, don't call a man a woman and don't use false pronouns. Don't ever say uh, two plus two uh, can equal five. Speak truthfully and trust that God, uh, trust God for the outcome, right? And he quotes Proverbs 23, 23. You know, two plus two will always equal four. I don't care who you are. Water is wet. The sun is hot. For every, those are called absolute truths, right? There's a people on the left that are trying to say absolute truths don't exist anymore. And, and they're pushing relativism. What's true for me may not be true for you, but that's okay, right? Don't accept lies. Number, uh, and finally, number nine, be confident and trust God. He's in control. We do not need to fear man ever, right? Psalms 118.6. No matter what may come, be it trials or sickness or persecution, even unto death, we cling to our hope of a resurrected Savior who has ransomed, them, uh, ransomed us from the power of Satan, sin, and this dark world. Christ is King. Amen? Yes. He is Lord. And He laughs at the nations who resist His rule. He has put the, the worldly powers on notice and, and on the run, if we are in Christ, we have already conquered. The world may kill the body, but it cannot destroy our souls. More could be said clearly about the historical nature of the persecution of the church and has faced that the church has faced throughout the centuries, uh, as, as noted uh, in the books that, that I've, I've shared with you th this morning. But it's important simply to recognize that we don't have to be lunch meat for the hungry lion, right? Satan's like a lion prowling, prowling, prowling around, seeing who he can devour, right? We don't have to be his lunch. Listen, you either live in fear or you live in faith. I choose to live in faith. How about you? Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Amen. You know the word amen means so be it, right? So be it? So be it. All right. Listen, any questions or thoughts or comments about the persecuted church, what our stance should be, uh, and how we can uh, continue to live uh, a victorious life in Christ despite what goes on in the world? Any, any comments on any of that? I can. I, I can definitely. We can go make copies for everybody right now. Okay. Or I can email it or text it to you. I can do either or. Copies. copies. All right. Fantastic. We'll make copies for all of us. All right. Any, anything else? Lois, you got anything? Not to have a copy. Or, or, or comments or questions or concerns? Oh, no, I don't have any others. I just know it's, it gets more and more difficult to keep your mind straight. But that's why it's so important to do just what we're doing right now. Gathering as a bunch of Amen. Christian believers, keeping Christ at the center, keeping His Word at the center, and being an encouragement one to another. We support each other. Amen? Amen. We support each other. Amen? Amen. All right. Yeah. Got to make sure you're awake, right? Listen, we need each other. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. We need to hold each other accountable to the truth of God's Word. We need to encourage each other. We need to correct each other at times, right? Exhort one another, right? This is what the Bible calls us to do, right? When I mentioned the idea of starting camp, you know, starting a building fund for Camp Treehouse, these two immediately came to me with this book to try and encourage me. And I've been reading through the book, and I've been encouraged. Thank you. This is what Christian brothers and sisters should do, right? And, and I've asked them to purchase five copies so I could have our elder board read through the book as well, right? So uh, please, please, please keep me in your prayers daily. I, I'm, listen, just, let's just be honest. Well, let me close this out, and, and then we're going to have another talk, okay? Uh, it'll be a brief talk. Uh, to close this out, David... David, can you pray and close us out, brother? Okay. Father God, we're gracious for the blessings of this.